Worthy. I'm Kira. Welcome to my home in Brooklyn. Let me show you around. Watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. My name is Kira Coffey and I'm a writer as well as a set designer and prop stylist. My house is a little hard to explain. It's a bit eclectic. It has lots of handmade items that I've made. Being a prop stylist, I really spend a lot of time making things work sort of on the macro scale and the micro scale of items and colors and textures. I have a lot of artwork from loved ones all over the walls and um, also, there's sort of a theme of reuse a lot in my crafts and in my uh, furniture even. I do a lot of thrifting and, um, well, you'll see as we go. My brownstone is in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and it's a typical brownstone. This was built in the late 1800s, and um, a lot of the brownstones in the area, which are townhouses for people who are not from New York, have a lot of similar architectural details and a lot of the mantles look very similar. A lot of them are situated in the same places. Many of the brownstones look alike. And the neighborhood, um, I would say now it's largely a family neighborhood. A lot of families live here. We have a gigantic park really close by, so that's a big draw. Um, and it's tree-lined and lovely. I've lived in this apartment for around 27 years, which is longer than I ever thought I would be anywhere. I came here from another apartment just one block away, and I'd been looking for apartments for months and months. And somehow when I walked in here, I just knew, you know, I just knew this was the one. And the rent was a little higher than my budget at the time, which now sounds so low. But um, it had, you know, the brownstones uh, in this neighborhood are all lined up, packed one against another. And this one, because it's the last on the block in the row, has a window on the side, which you'll see in the living room. And it's really unusual and it makes the space feel open. So that was a really big difference that I instantly noticed and loved. And um, I sadly had to tell the landlady, it's too much for my, you know, it's higher than my budget and I have to say no. And then she called me back the next day. It's sort of unheard of in New York for someone to reach out and say, I'm going to lower the rent. I'm going to meet your budget. And she did. Welcome to my dining room slash office. This is the first room you come into in my apartment and it serves many purposes. Um, my table is obviously where I eat and host dinners and all that. And also though, it's where I, it's my studio. <laughs> this is my tiny studio. So I do a ton of artwork and crafting on this table and it was made to withstand glue and paint and everything and uh, not, you know, I don't worry about, I'm not too precious about it. And then over here at my desk is where I do um, all of my writing and obviously a ton of computer work. Um, so it serves a couple of purposes. And a lot of what this room sort of has to handle is having all of my supplies, but not be too obvious or visible because not all my art supplies are attractive. So um, I have made use of some things like, I know these are tiny little pencils that I hate to throw away because they're so useful, but they're ridiculously tiny and they don't fit in my pen cup. So those live there. And a lot of my erasers sit in this uh, paper mache bowl that I made. Um, I sort of have ways of hiding my um, supplies everywhere. And over here is a bookcase that I grabbed off the street. It was being thrown away. And this hides a multitude of sins behind this curtain. <laughs> Tons of supplies that are not very attractive. This shelf, which holds all of my craft supplies, I actually found on the street. A neighbor was giving it away and I decided to bring it home. It was probably about three, four blocks away and I went to go lift it up because I took a lot of things home and it was so heavy. It's like super heavy. I don't know if it's masonite or what, but it's solid. 
and I was struggling. I didn't want to give it up. And then a young woman was walking by and just offered to help me carry it home. She didn't even know where I lived. And I said, no, no, it's not that far. So we struggled and got this home. And then she did not want to help me up the stairs. I said, don't worry about it. I'm going to get it up the stairs. And she left. And now we follow each other on Instagram. Um, but I think of her a lot because this is why I have this shelf. This whole area is really not meant to be super elegant. It's really my workhorse, this shelf, because it holds so many supplies. This curtain that I made, I haven't even sewn it yet. It's just uh, pinned together with safety pins. It happens to be a really beautiful fabric that a friend of mine who's a textile designer sells. And it's a linen that's what he calls the heaviest linen. And it was made to work for sailors many, many, many years ago. And the weave is so tight that when, and linen swells when it gets wet. So when it gets wet, it actually becomes watertight, which is just a super cool element of it, even though I do not use it in water. <laughs> Um, and then this tea container, someone, someone gave this to me and it was just sort of a crappy little um, tin. And then I covered it in paper mache to make it a little more interesting. Um, this is actually a lovely piece. This is a, a wood elephant that a friend of mine, Matt Austin, made. And it came, it has magnets on the side and it came with um, wooden, he made wooden wings for it that could come on and come on and off, and I realized it was much better suited for me to hold my pins. This is another example of me hiding my supplies in plain sight. Um, and then these guys are just lucite pieces left over from some shoot that I liked for the color of them. And these animals will not be here forever. They were made for a shoot, and they probably will go to a shoot, but what's interesting about them is, I made another one too that I don't know where it is, but I, there, I needed a lot of weight at the bottom to hold this long, these long pieces coming out. So um, these are on boxes of things like baking soda, filled with baking soda still. Um, and this one, I can't remember what's in this one, but I wanted them to be uh, heavy enough to hold what was coming out, to, out of it. So um, those are funny little, yeah, that's baking soda, <laughs> which is funny. You can hear it inside. Um, so these pieces, a lot of these things move around and may live somewhere else in another month. Um, and this is an artwork, a pastel by my mom. My mom is an artist. My mom has always been an artist. Most of her career has been in pastels, but she's also made sculptures. She taught me how to make paper mache. Well, she taught me a ton, actually. Um, and so a lot of her drawings and artwork uh, are in my house. I'm so lucky. The apartment hasn't changed that much. I mean, I was very lucky. The tenant who lived here before me was um, a really stylish guy, I think, because he had stripped a lot of the wood around the window frames and he had done plastering on the ceiling and made some built-in cabinets. So I was super lucky about that. Um, however, he loved the color pink, did not want anything that was not pink. And so every single room was painted like Pepto-Bismol pink. I think my style really ranges, but it's usually quite colorful and I like to layer pattern and color and texture. So it's kind of a rich style. I don't know if I have, if there's a word that describes it all, but um, I would say colorful and eclectic. So this is my coat rack, <laughs> not so interesting, but I decided when the coats are not on it, it looks sort of plain. And so I hung this artwork very low and in a strange place. And then I really liked it for some reason. It's so quirky and strange. And then I went further and hung my paper recycling down super low. This is a bag that's made of paper, even though it doesn't look like paper. Um, and I thought it was fun to use it for paper. So this whole configuration is very atypical because everything's so low. This is my sort of door side everything table. You know, you come in the door, put your stuff down. And I have a couple of pieces that I love here. This, this pot was made by uh, my stepfather many, many years ago in the 70s. And um, I actually right now use it to just put my sunglasses in, but it's so big and I wanted to use it I wanted to raise the level inside, so I put all of my balls and super balls inside of it to sort of hold up. I don't know if you can see, it's pretty funny. <laughs> That's what's holding up my sunglasses. <laughs> um, and then, um, this is sort of funny. This is my buzzer, really old, funky New York bell system. This is, 
I mean, it doesn't even work. I can hear the bell ring, but I can't buzz anyone in. And it was so askew and so um, funky that I decided one day to just cover it with all of this paper mache. This is a page from a gem book that I had. And these are, I just made these protrusions out of paper mache and covered them with old stamps. I just needed to make it a little more attractive. So that was my attempt. Who knows, we'll see if I change it again. And then these are some drawings that my mom made. This is a drawing of my grandmother's arm, which I love. It's just a little study she did. I guess she was planning a bigger artwork. And this is kind of a, this is a good example of the temporary nature of my, my decor. This is obviously not a perfect or framed drawing, but I really like it. And I haven't figured out what I want to go here exactly right now. So that's a, placeholder, I think. And then down here are a couple of other things that I made. I covered this jar with rice paper, marbled paper. Um, and then this little doodad is such a funny thing. This was, this bottom part was the top of a seltzer bottle. And then I made these little pieces to go on the sides. Um, at the time I was using all of these essential oils. And so each one held an essential oil that I was using at the time, but then I kind of stopped using that. So, um, it's become a different kind of holder. This used to hold eye drops. It helped, I, again, I'm just trying to hide some of the things that I have around to make them look a little more attractive. So that's how that evolved. In this photograph, I have one a sister, a sister, a sister, and then two family friends from childhood. And um, it was taken by, I think my uncle from inside of his car. And I think that's in the 60s. I don't even know. I wasn't born yet. So this cabinet, which I love, um, it's really simple and elegant and was given to me by a friend. I, I really, it, the finish is funky and I really would love to refinish it someday soon and get it either to be a beautiful, uh, beautifully finished wood finish or maybe even a beautifully painted piece, uh, maybe lacquer, I don't know. I, I haven't done it yet, but that's my vision for it. My apartment, it, you could not be anyone else's. It really holds so much of me. A lot of the items are things that I've made. A lot of the artwork or art pieces that my loved ones have made. It's just uniquely me. I have my own way of doing things. I like sizzles of hot color here and there. I like sort of lowly materials mixed with really fine materials. So it just sort of has a texture that is me. my sideboard, but I don't exactly use it as a typical sideboard. I mean, I do on the surface, but it's holding so many arts and crafts supplies. I can't even, I won't even open the drawers, but there's a lot of handmade elements uh, on the top. This is a tray that I paper mache It was a wicker tray that my neighbor was getting rid of. And I just decided to paper mache to make it more interesting. Um, this is a pot that, another pot that my stepfather made many years ago. And this is a really weird little piece. No one else would want it but me, but it was, a neighbor was throwing away this funny little cabinet that had martini glasses as drawer poles. And it was just sort of hideous, but um, I thought it had potential. And I added this whole yoke on top with paper mache and then made little handles with um, clay. And it holds, again, this is like, Meta, it holds, it's hiding a bunch of supplies and then in it are, are things also hiding supplies. This is my magnesium powder <laughs> um, and I paper mache this. You know, it's just um, a series of ways to, to make things look pretty. This artwork has stayed the same for a while. This is a lovely pastel by my mom and it's her view out of her window on a sort of rainy day, which I love. Um, this, and my mom's name by the way is Nancy Rothstein. Um, this is a pastel by the artist Michael Oatman. Um, this is another pastel by my mom, which I love. And this is not always here. This is actually an envelope um, that I made. I, um, I don't know if you can see. So I found a painting that was being thrown away on the street and I thought, oh, what can I, what can I do with this? It's, such, it, it's I don't know if you can see the, the really cool crackly texture in it. Um, so I made two things out of it. I made this envelope, which I like a lot and have not sent yet, but plan to. And then I also made a paper file folder um, that I can show you uh, also out of that painting. I have no idea whose painting it was, but it was fun to just sort of look at it and see what I could make, give it a second life. 
medicine cabinet, which I'm actually using for a lot of vitamins and sewing supplies, um, was in a really industrial studio uh, that a friend had, and it had like ancient, it did have medical supplies, but they were ancient, and he realized there's no way anyone was using it, and so we took it down, and I was able to, <laughs> I'm trying to open it, uh, I was able to take it for myself. Um, this is a little embarrassing, um, but I do love it, and I like how slim it is, and this was the original painting that was on it, so I like it for its, that it's a time capsule, you know. This is my everything table. It's my dining table. It's my studio table. It's my everything table. I sometimes even lie here to stretch <laughs> if I need to hang my legs off the table. Um, and this table was really, was made by my friend Matt Austin, who's a genius. And it is really, it's made to be attractive, but it's made to really use and abuse. So I never worry, I don't use coasters, I don't worry about getting paint on it. It often has paper mache and glue all over it, and then I just sort of scrape it off and use it. There are stains all over it. I've drilled into it by accident. I mean, I've done some things to it, but it's a really great table and it's on wheels so I can move it around. This table has a steel base around it. And about 10 years ago, I had a dream that I took some magnets and magnetized some scissors onto it so that I would always have them when I'm sitting in my chair working on stuff. So I actually did that. Um, these scissors live on the table, underneath the table, just on magnets. And I was telling my friend Todd Oldham that, that I had dreamt that and that I did that. And he said, oh, well, that's funny because that's what all the couture houses in, in France do. They, they magnetize the scissors to the table. So I thought that was genius of me. And then on the table, um, I have a rotating bunch of things for the table. Because I use it so much to do my work on, it really just has to get cleared off a lot. So I don't keep a lot on the table normally, but I do love this paper mache cake that my mom made. It's super light. I'm probably gonna knock it off. It's, it's a super light, lovely piece. And for some reason, it's just so cheery to me and it's so perfect. So I have it out whenever I'm not working on the table because I love it. I find vegetables so beautiful. This is just some chard that I bought at my food co-op. And I, you know, they're so beautiful. So whenever I can, I use fresh, produce as sort of prop pieces if they don't need to be refrigerated at the moment. I just think they're so gorgeous and lush. So I have them out like a bouquet, which I do often. <laughs> it's just something I like. My apartment's very, very old and my radiators, they work beautifully, but they're very old and not particularly attractive. And so this is a radiator cover that my brother-in-law made, James Kava, and it's clever because it has all these space in, in between for the heat to get out, but um, it's attractive. And um, he did me a giant favor by making this and designing it. Um, and then above it, I have, this is an old uh, ceramic vase from Argentina, but someone gave it to me. I used to work in a flower shop and the flower shop owner, who's an amazing artist herself, found this and gave it to me and I saved it for a very long time. And I thought it went well with this ceramic piece that I found in a thrift store that's kind of bizarre. Um, it's abstract and I'm not sure exactly what it is. I find it super beautiful, but it had this big chip in it. So I decided to just not use it for flowers and to just sort of make an art piece out of it of my own. I have a good friend who sells beautiful, beautiful things at a flea market in New York. And she sold me this lovely needle pointed lion, which I adore. And I do feel like the black of that and the black of this and a little bit of the black of this um, candle, sometimes I find black grounds things, uh, visually speaking. And so sometimes I use it to pull things together and look a little more traditional, even though they're not. And this mobile, which my mom made, um, has this lovely eye that's open on one side, closed on the other. It's sort of, here, maybe it'll go around, yeah. Um, it's black and white, so it has a certain formal quality, but it's so playful. So I really like to have it here. It's, it brings a little whimsy to this corner. So most everyone watching will not be old enough to know, but there used to be little tables that were called typing tables when people would type on a typewriter. And this was one of them, and it's really super old, and it had these leaves that would come up and give you more space. And I 
it was just an old relic that was sitting around my mom's and I covered it with linoleum tile, which I don't even know if they make linoleum tile anymore, but um, just as a way to have some color on the top. And I, it's, it's on wheels, so it's a super handy little side table. I just covered a glass dish in paper. So it's paper mache and these are some gems that I put around side it. And I like that it's low because I have easy access to things like erasers this way. And you know, I change it up all the time. For many years when I wrote about design for magazines, national magazines, I kind of needed a blanker canvas at home. I wanted something where I was going around and looking at tons and tons of houses all the time and styling them and photographing them and designing sets. And I needed something a little bit calmer at home. So I used to have a more calm atmosphere, minimalist, not minimalist, but more minimal than now. But over time, I guess my work has changed and I do less writing for magazines, I'm scouting less, fewer locations, and spending less time in other people's spaces, so doing more set design. And I realized that what I kept doing on set whenever I could was make props myself, make something myself, and some of it related to ancient architecture or, you know, Grecian urns, and some of it was just completely mine. And um, from that practice starting of making things, I realized, why don't I just make things at home at, to please me, you know, to not have to do it for a client, but to do it for me. And, and what happened was um, when I, often, when I realized I wanted something, I have really good taste because I've been around some lovely things on my, all, all of my photo shoots, but I can't always afford it. So I started to think about, well, how can I make this? How can I make something I really like um, to make it affordable, but attractive. So that kind of infiltrated everywhere into my apartment. You know, I made a funky little TV cozy that no one else might like, but I love. There are just examples of it everywhere. A lot of my vessels to hold things are handmade, and that was born of me practicing that on photo shoots. I live in a brownstone in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and many, many of the brownstones have a very similar, not just layout, but they all have two fireplaces situated exactly like mine are, and they're so similar. I don't know if they use the same stone workers or designers, but much of the, the stonework around the fireplaces is the same or almost the same from house to house to house. So, you know, it's old and stained and funky, but it's quite beautiful and I really love natural stone, so I think of it as a plus. And here's another thing, here's a little, um, here's a little none, another one of my hiding things in plain sight. So a lot of times I'm working on paper or cardboard and I need to weigh it down because of glue or paper mache, you know, I just really need some weight on it. And so uh, I have this stack of marble blocks that some company was just throwing away, they're on the street in New York City and so I've stacked them. They kind of hide in plain sight with the um, fireplace. And so here, you might not notice them, but here is my stack of weights that I use for my artwork. And they kind of blend in really well. <laughs> and then this folder is the partner piece to that envelope. This was part, it's, I just made it into a folder holding receipts, um, but it was made from the same painting that that envelope was made from. Isn't it great? I love, how, I, love, I love how odd it is and I love the crackly texture of it. The idea of inspiration is really interesting to me and I think everyone's different in where they find inspiration. I find it everywhere. I do go to a lot of museums and art shows and for sure I'm interested and inspired a lot by artwork, but also I often have, get ideas from literally trash on the street or like a string that's shaped like a letter that's on, on the ground. I have a whole alphabet of um, trash shaped like letters. I mean, that's sort of silly, but it's just an example of how I find inspiration everywhere. I find ideas everywhere. Um, I think you just sort of, if you have a curious eye and a curious nature, it's kind of everywhere. For sure, nature inspires me. Um, you know, walks in the park, walks in the woods, um, and then just lots of looking, 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 looking at, you know, everything and anything. And here we have my living room. And in the first nook that leads into it, I have a few fun things. A lovely photo of my niece and nephew years ago by the photographer Daniel Ballesteros, which is 
gorgeous portrait. And then beside it is another pastel of my mom's of our old bathroom when I was growing up, so it's a little bit nostalgic for me. This is a super old box that I got from my mom. Um, many, she had it, I think, most of my childhood, so I'm not sure where it came from, but it's a lovely old piece. And then this uh, big crown box was from my dad, um, and it's a music box, which is not currently on. There it is. And it's a, it's a piece, it's a really funny thing. My dad in the 70s when he was, you know, smoking grass as they called it and doing all kinds of things would stash his drugs in this box. So I have my dad's whole drug box, which I use for jewelry. I have two bookshelves and this is the bigger one. It was made by a friend's father who's a woodworker and gosh, I just have lots of stuff on it that's gathered or homemade. This is a big beach ball that I made for a photo shoot that I was doing. And actually I made two of them because the first one came out sort of terribly. I'll, I'll see if I can spin it for you. <laughs> um, and so I made a second one and I kept this one just because it's lovely. It's paper mache. Very imperfect, but there it is. Um, I made this paper mache stand for some thrift pieces. I, I grabbed these funny beaded fruits from different thrift stores over the years. A friend of mine gave me this gigantic red crayon, which is, re I think it, it's a real crayon. And um, she got it from a thrift store and I just keep it here because I think it's funny to have a gigantic. Sometimes I think a little humor is good in a tableau. Sometimes you want more seriousness and balance and sometimes you just want some humor. So that's why that's there. Above the bookcase is a pastel that my mom made. I guess I seem to have a lot of pastels that she made of my childhood uh, surroundings. Um, so this is a backyard that was visible from, uh, from our house and uh, I really love it. I have to fix it. It's a, I have to reframe it, remat it. It needs some help. This is a pillow that I put here recently. It's made by Todd Oldham's uh, company called Todd Oldham Maker Shop, and it's made by ribbons that are woven together. I don't know if you can see them. They sort of weave in and out and make just such a gorgeous texture. And then they sit beside the second mantle in my apartment. This is a tricky little spot for me as far as making the right tableau. I mostly just use it for candles, but candles to me are not that attractive. And of course, then they make a mess. So I kind of put together this really, um, this tableau of many, many pieces, and it changes a lot because it really just reflects what I'm into right now. So I guess this is not right now, but in the fall, I found this pod from an old, uh, from a tree and just put it in this tiny little vase that I have, and I think that makes it a perfect stopper. Um, I have some dice here made of plaster that my friend Matt Austin made, and those just make me laugh, and they're so sweet. Um, I guess this area is sort of to sort of pull your interest in and take a closer look. So, you know, I have this lovely crystal egg. This is a I found this in the bins of marble scraps and just thought it was a perfect shape. Um, one summer I was eating a ton of blueberries and these are from the blueberry, um, those paper blueberry cups that blueberries come in, so I made a little cast of them. Um, it just sort of reflects, I guess, all of my obsessions and uh, it changes all the time. And this is one of those great rocks. I, I, I thought this was a real rock, and then it turns out this was um, man-made, but it's so beautiful. So I keep this here to hold this little candle holder on. And you know, when I go on a walk in the park and I collect things, which I do all the time, this is where a lot of stuff ends up, or a tiny little weird Barbie shoe might end up here because it pulls your eye in and so you're looking closely and it enables me to really use some of the tiny, tiny things that I love. Because I use this mantle for candles all the time, I've sort of taken apart a matchbox and so I keep my matches here and then I took off the striker from the matchbox and I just sort of fun tacked it here so that I can light a match here. I don't think, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, there we go. So, and then I use that for my candles. But it's a way to have a matchbox out that's attractive because the matches themselves are nice, but then I don't have to look at the box. And if, if the striker wears out, I just cut off another one from another box. I think it's funny to put things in places that are unexpected. So I hung this little painting on the marble mantel, which does not make any sense, but it sort of ties together this table tableau and looks very sweet there and sort of funny because it's totally unexpected. In any space, I like to think about balance. And so for me, I have these bigger pieces of furniture and I, I use them to offset 
you know, the most of my bookcases I think of as like rectangles of happy chatter. You know, there's a lot of a lot of tiny detail in, in bookcases, and I put a lot of stuff in them. And so that's sort of a noisy little uh, happy bit of of energy. And then I like to counter those with sort of slower talking pieces of furniture, which are bigger and heftier and a little bit plainer. So um, a lot of stuff is from thrift stores, not all of it, but these I have two of these chairs and these are from thrift stores that I got recovered. Um, and this is just a little um, rug sample that I threw on there because it's more comfortable. It's super soft silk. Um, and then this pillow is a really valuable, lovely pillow designed by Alexander Girard. And he was a mid-century designer of many textiles and objects. And um, I'm writing a book about him for uh, Fade and Press, which comes out in October. And then the couch is really about comfort and a little bit of pattern. And what's interesting here on the couch are my pillows. This, um, this watermelon print, um, that's actually embroidery. And it was based on a watermelon print that the artist Ruth Ozawa made. And I loved, loved, loved it and asked this uh, friend of mine who's a costume designer if he could turn it into embroidery, which he did. And it's kind of this amazing, beautiful watermelon pillow. And he also created this pillow with the fishes on it, um, again, from an image that I loved. And so I'm very lucky to have these beautiful pieces of artwork on the couch. I really have a theme about trying to hide things that I have around a lot that are not so attractive. I don't love a lot of packaging. So on my coffee table, I'm often, when I'm sitting here watching TV or reading, I often, that's the time when I'm quiet and I often decide to lotion my hands. And I couldn't find a hand lotion container that I liked. So I just took a regular tub and covered it in paper mache. And then I also, um, use these eardrops <laughs> so that are kind of tall and some magnesium spray that's tall. And I couldn't just look at these ugly bottles. So I made this out of a, this is the bottom of a seltzer bottle. This is a super ball and I covered it in paper mache. I'm not going to show you what's inside because it's unattractive, but it basically opens like this and sits simply on the table and I can bear to look at it. And then um, this is just a, a sweet little piece of coral that my friend Todd Oldham covered in drawings. I don't know if you can see um, when he was on the beach in, I think, St. Lucia. And I just, there's something so nice about the coral texture and his lovely little design. Above the couch, I really needed a lamp, but I do really love putting things in odd places. And so I got this lamp from my friend Matt and he uh, knows me well. And he said, let's just, <laughs> let's just drill it to the door. And I don't use this door, so it's fine. And it's just sort of a funny, unexpected place to have something drilled into. So I, I, I find humor in that and I really like it. And then next to it is a really lovely painting of my great aunt by my mom. So my mom painted this of her aunt. It's a beautiful portrait to me because it's very earthbound and specific because it's her in her kitchen and she cooked a lot. And yet the whole side of it, the whole other side of it is ethereal and um, her in the world with the clouds and the sky behind her. My favorite part of my home is that it changes constantly. You know, my moods change all the time. What I want to look at changes all the time. And so my apartment's sort of built to be um, not transitory, but mobile. And so I can change color schemes really easily. I can change items really easily. It just is always changing and that suits me really well. this is my favorite little tableau. I've moved these things around for a um, better part of a year, but now I really like where they are. Um, I, I found some, it's hard, to, I, you probably can't see on camera, but I found some really beautiful dried leaves that have pink spots on them. And I gathered them maniacally from a wet winter walk <laughs> in the park. And then I, I painted some branches pink because they were not on the branches. And then I glued this together. This is a uh, Frank and twig <laughs> of sorts. Um, so those are sitting next to some beloved objects. These are, these are rocks that my mom gathered. And I don't know why I feel nostalgic about the rocks that my mom gathered, but I do. And I love them because she chose them. Um, and then this is a really odd, uh, one of my more recent paper mache pieces, which is um, based on a Grecian urn. And it sort of changes throughout. I don't know if I could turn it for you very well. Yeah, there you go. Um, so this though is funny because this whole, 
portion is an upside down plastic tub from pretzels that I found in the trash. Um, and then I kind of made the rest of it with materials that I had at home, like big tin foil tin. And uh, these are from rope that I wired together. So this is, I, I really do love Corinthian Egyptian pots and I was obsessed with them and looking at all, there's so many patterns that I love and I just wanted to adopt all of them, which I couldn't, but um, I used as many as I thought worked for this one piece. And it, it's sort of, for me, when I get an obsession with something like a period of art, I just need to, you know, ingest it and then make something of my own and then I can kind of let that go. Otherwise, I just keep, it keeps going around and around in my head. This is a little vessel that doesn't always hold a rock. It's currently holding a rock. Um, that's actually a fossil. Um, but this was made from a little bottle of mouthwash. And then I added these arms and it's different colors on different sides. Um, and then the only other important thing here, I mean, I do love a tiny little pencil like this because how did they sharpen that down so low? But also it's beside a, a sculpture of a pencil that a friend of mine, Barbara Weisberger made, which I really, love so much. So these live kind of together, the real pencil and the sculpture pencil. And then above it is, this is another pastel that my mom made and it's of a woman outside of a fruit stand. And I love it for many reasons, but one of them is we grew up in a neighborhood of working class immigrants, um, many from Europe, but really from all over. And to me, she captures the, you know, a woman who is maybe not super beautiful, but in the way that my mother sees a lot of these people and the way that she draws them, um, you sort of see the beauty of who they are as people. To me, this is a romantic view of a very um, hardworking woman, immigrant, very typical of the neighborhood I grew up in. So this is my TV um, and you know, like everyone else, no one wants to look at a black rectangle when you're not watching TV. So I thought a lot about what I could do and I had big plans to make a beautiful textile cover for my TV. And then I just got uh, impatient and thought, you know, let me just make something today so I can cover it and then I'll make a textile one later, which of course I never did. But so this is just, these are just um, two or three bread bags, just paper, just sort of regular old paper and then I just glued a grid of um, sequins on it to make it a little more interesting and again I don't know that anyone else would like this but it suits me and I to the point where I actually have not made the fabric one to replace it so it's kind of a pain that it's not fabric because if it were fabric I could just sort of whisk it off and throw it away when I watch TV but given that it's paper it takes up a little room so it's not the perfect solution. Now I'll give you a little peek to my little bedroom come on in. When I first moved in here, my bedroom, this tiny little room, had a door on it, and I told the uh, my landlady's son, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to keep the door on. Do you want to put it in the basement or something? I'm not going to use it. And he asked me repeatedly, "Are you sure you don't want a door on your bedroom?" He just couldn't really believe it. Um, but finally, I convinced him that was 27 years ago. I have no idea where that door is, but now I just use a curtain, and I only close it when um, for air conditioning when I need to keep it cool in here. Otherwise, it's open. So my tiny bedroom is really hard to configure. It, I have a queen size bed, but it's so there's this doorway here, which is a closet, and then the entry doorway, and then a big window. So there's not really a lot of wall space. This is the only wall space here that the bed lies against. In the early years, I had it a couple of other ways, but it's really awkward. Um, even this is not ideal, but with a headboard, I can sort of keep it floating in, against away from the wall and, you know, have it work. This lamp is lovely and um, I don't remember. It's from a photo shoot. I bought it from a photo shoot that I was working on and um, I can't remember where it's from, but I really like it because you can sort of swing it side to side and have it be above you exactly where you want. You know, being into patterns and color, of course I think about my bedding all the time. I'm never pleased. I never have exactly what I want, but I do really love this wool blanket that I found at a thrift store in London. And it's, I think it's called, gosh, I hope I'm right. I think it's called an overshot blanket. And that means that it's this, it, it's 
the pattern is similar on the front and the back. So it has a backside, but it's not really, it's really attractive. And so there's a certain way that it's woven, and I think that's why it's called an overshot blanket. So I love it. It's a very strange shape. I don't know why, if that has anything to do with the fact that it was in England versus our beds, because you know beds are different sizes in different countries, but I use it as much as possible because I really love it. I think what gives a home soul is the homeowner's personality coming through it. So obviously we all live in our spaces, but not everyone feels confident or versatile enough to sort of express themselves through it. And I think it's really important. And so even if it's um, a unique way that they like to arrange flowers or their lack of pattern or their abundance of pattern, I think once a person starts really coming through their space, that's when it really gets full. And that's when it's the most interesting. You know, I've seen so many beautiful, expensive, expertly designed homes that really don't say a lot because they're beautiful, but they're a little bit void of uh, humanity. I think to me, home is not so much a place, but an idea. Home is, you know, where I get ideas, where ideas start to bloom, where I feel fruitful and creative and also relaxed. You know, for sure, I find my home a wonderful escape from the world and I need, I need to sort of take myself back and escape sometimes and just be here. Um, but still, it's more, um, a place in my mind than a physical place. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.